Well, hello, church. What a privilege to be together. Amen. Never take that for granted. Never presume upon it. Never imagine it's a right or a privilege. We've been, they've proven to us it's not guaranteed by anything other than the grace of God. So when we have the opportunity to be together, we want to take it gratefully and guard it jealously. Amen. People say, well, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. No kidding. But, but you will not make it in the midst of turmoil and confusion that is in currently unfolding and escalating apart from the strength of community. It's too difficult. We're hosting a little conference in a couple of weeks. Uh, we want to give you a little window into it. We've called it Culture and Christianity. We've invited some friends from across the country, really, to come and be a part of that. I'll be completely candid with you. To be a participant, it requires a little bit of an investment. Uh, more than anything, an investment of time. It's Friday and Saturday. Uh, formally, it ends on Saturday, the, the conference part, on Saturday at midday, but we've really included Saturday evening with the festival. We'll be outside that evening for church, and uh, who's our, Matthew West is our musical guest that weekend. So I would ask you, if, if it's a topic that is of interest to you, and you want to learn to be a more effective voice to make the investment, the investment of your time and your resources. There's a ticket fee for it, which is unusual for us. We do festivals in the spring and the fall with everybody from Crowder to Matthew West, and there's no tickets. Everybody's welcome. But we have people so far registered from more than 30 states coming to the conference, and we can't have people traveling that far and not be able to get a seat. So the tickets are a necessity to do that. It is not a for-profit venture, trust me. We live up to our nonprofit status. <laughs> But please don't take it for granted either. If there's someone that you think would benefit from it, if it's not of interest to you and you know someone who would benefit, perhaps you helped them. Uh, it is such an important time to be aware of what's happening, to watch, to listen, to think, and be prepared to act. And to do that is going to take more than whatever our normal responses have been. We cannot continue in the direction on the trajectory that we have been walking. And so for that reason, we have done this. It's a little activity beyond our normal routine. We had to volunteer for extra work. That's nuts, isn't it? We do three services a week. Let's do seven or eight more. <laughs> but we think it's worthwhile. It will not be live streamed um, for a variety of reasons. It gives us a bit more freedom. The people that are traveling from across the country and, and making that investment. So uh, we'll share some of the content after the fact. But if you're imagining, you can just sit it out and watch it on the beach with your phone. Uh, this is one of those instances where that will not be true. So at least pray about it. And most of all, pray that the Lord will bless us, that he will gather those people that he wants to be here, that what is said will honor him. You know, there are many voices in our culture that are telling the truth about what's happening. But I believe what is essential and often doesn't get included in that is a biblical perspective about what God's people should do. We have to be the people of faith. We have been church attenders, and we have been moralists, but we have to understand what it means to be the people of faith in this unique season of history. And with God's help, we will take a baby step towards that at the end of this month. Will you pray? I mean, I got a friend in the house today. I just want to introduce him, Kevin McGarry from California. Um, he spends a lot of time traveling our country, telling the truth to people that will listen about culture and what's happening, and he's just passing over Tennessee and dropped in this morning for worship. Kevin, we're glad to have you. Why don't you give a stand, huh? That is proof there is a Christ follower in California. I mean, he's not there today, but he's going back, so pray for them. Huh. Well, for our offertory prayer today, I want to do something a little differently. I put it in your notes. It's the doxology from the book of Romans. It is a declaration of the glory of God. Romans is, is arguably the most remarkable treatise of the Christian faith that has ever been put together. And the Apostle Paul, near its conclusion, put in this doxology. And in the midst of a world that seems upside down this morning, I wanted collectively, corporately, with the people of God to give, give expression to this remarkable statement. So whatever is going on in your life, whatever needs you have, whatever aspect of the, 
The larger circumstances of our world may be troubling you today, and there are many troubling things happening. I want us to together declare the glory of God. Because at the end of the day, the one who created the heavens and the earth and laid the foundations of the world and formed your spirit within you and within me, he's watching over us. Isn't that good news? Amen. Amen. If you're a guest and visiting with us since COVID, we don't pass on a regular basis offering plates. And our congregation is so creative and generous, they've learned to give in other ways. And I thank you for your faithfulness, because without your faithfulness and stewardship and your willingness to give your tithes to the Lord, our ministry would be backing up, and we are not. And a great deal of that is because of your faithfulness. But our corporate prayers, we understand, have begun to change us. And they're a very important part of when we are together. So if you'll stand with me, we're going to read this together. It's on your outlines. They'll put it on the screens if you didn't want one of those outlines. If you're joining us online, you can download those outlines. Outlines everywhere. We're just going to read it. It's Romans 11, 33 to 36. This is our declaration this morning. We want to be on record. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand, huh? Before you're seated, find a couple of people who didn't come in your car and tell them Jesus is Lord. Will you do that? Good morning. Hallelujah. What a beautiful morning to be together. If you're joining on us online, we're sorry you're not in the house, but we're glad you love the Lord. I want to continue a little series we've been working through called God is Moving because I believe He is. God is moving in the earth in most unprecedented ways, ways I've never seen in my lifetime. I hear evidence of it week after week. People come to me with reports of the, God's supernatural involvement in their lives, miracles that are happening. Uh, we see evidence of it just in so many ways. We also see evidence that evil is moving with a greater brazenness, a greater boldness than ever expressed in my lifetime, brazenly standing in the public square, mocking God, biblical worldview, biblical principles, to the point that if you're indifferent, if you're lukewarm, it'll cause you to stand in the shadows. It's decision time to decide whether we're going to move with the Lord or we'll be swept along in the tides that are going in another direction. It's a season where I believe the middle is in great trouble. That sitting on the fence is no longer a, a reasonable imagination for a posture that you can hold. It's an exciting time, but it's a time for the church to be prepared. It, it's a time for a bit of a change of cadence on our part. I happen to think that's a good thing. I've spent my adult life in the church, and I, I'm grateful for the church of Jesus Christ. But I want to see us flourish. I want to see us shine in this season. And I want to do my best to help the church be prepared. In this session, we're going to talk a bit about Israel, the church, and the nations. Some of this I have written down because I could get emotional and we would end up in the weeds. Um, I have been to Israel since last Sunday. We made a very quick trip. There were some meetings that we needed to take, and uh, there was a little opening in the calendar, and, and we stepped through it. On Thursday, we were standing on the edge of Gaza and spent the day looking at um, memorials to the more than 1,000 Israelis who were brutally murdered October the 7th of last year. I tell you, some people have denied it and say it didn't happen, that it's a fabrication of the media, and I can tell you they lie. A few weeks ago, we were in Washington, D.C. at the Israeli embassy, and we saw some raw footage of that day. 
but it was a totally different experience to stand on the ground in those communities. A dear friend of mine, a man I've known for 20 years, lived in one of those neighborhoods, and he said, I locked my family in the house. The only weapon I had was a knife, and I stood in front of my front door. And now she said, I saw the terrorists. They were four doors down, and they turned and went the other direction. We left Friday morning, and by last evening there were missiles falling in Jerusalem. So I've been to Israel since last Sunday. There were some necessary meetings for me to attend, and as we traveled home on Friday, I made some notes sitting on a plane. And I'd like to begin by just sharing those. It's the safest way for me to have this dialogue. Israel today is a nation besieged. There's a heaviness that has settled upon the people that I've never seen. I was there during the Intifada. I've been there when wars have broken out. I've been in and out of Israel since I was a boy, but I've never seen the heaviness that rests upon the people today. The price of freedom to our friends there seems very high. The determination of their adversaries seems unrelenting. Their enemies boast. They're filled with an arrogant pride and a sense of confidence. They're trusted friends amongst the nations, such as the United States, have stepped away and demanded that Israel submit to their murderous enemies. In Israel, there's an unprecedented loss of trust in their own leaders, in the government, in the military, and ultimately in their security. There are grim warnings, and they're no longer just grim warnings, of impending attacks from powerful nations and their proxies. The economy is struggling. Propaganda regarding Israel flourishes. And the truth, when it's spoken, is whispered. It is seldom boldly declared. Those that understand the truth don't want to incur the wrath of those propagating the anti-Semitic lies. So silence tends to dominate. It's in stark contrast to what's happening in other places in our world. There's a hatred expressed towards Israel and the Jewish people that is not expressed uniformly. There's no real move against Bashar al-Assad, the Syrian dictator who has destroyed his nation. He used poison gas against his own people. Millions of Syrian refugees were driven into Europe and there were simply no calls from the international community nor from the Muslim street to return them to their historic homes. They were happy for them to become permanent refugees, invaders, if you prefer, of Europe. That's a very stark contrast to the attitudes towards Palestinians. There's been no real move against Sudanese leaders who have fomented a seemingly endless civil war. Untold numbers of innocent people have been brutally murdered. And you've not heard our State Department or the United Nations calling for some humanitarian whatever. There are no significant sanctions on China today who boldly works to destroy our own national interest without apology, with great clarity and persistence. They oppress their political opponents violently. They utilize slave labor. They limit human freedom. And we celebrate them as an amazing society. We give billions of dollars to Iran, who as a matter of public policy fund terrorist organizations. They threaten innocent civilians in multiple nations. If you haven't been watching, more dollars, more U.S. dollars have gone into Iran in the last three years through direct support or the purchase of their petroleum than we have given to Ukraine, Taiwan, and Israel combined. If you're not watching, that means we're funding the violence that, you, that Iran is perpetuating around the Middle East and throughout the world. They say repeatedly and consistently they intend to destroy Israel, the little Satan, and the United States, the great Satan. And we fund them. There's no real cry or even interest in a humanitarian ceasefire in Ukraine and their war with Russia even though 500,000 people have died in a war, to be clear, which we largely provoked. There's no real move on our own continent against Mexican drug cartels who are trafficking women and children on our own border. 
funneling fentanyl, fentanyl into our country, resulting in the deaths of tens of thousands of Americans. But we are told consistently from the halls of Congress and from media sources, elevated platforms of academia, and even from pulpits, that Israel is an unacceptable aggressor, the perpetrator of genocidal intent, and we must demand that they stop and care for an enemy who has sworn to destroy them. That is the most common mantra. An enemy who in an unprovoked attack murdered more than 1,200 men, women, and children. An enemy who without apology raped, tortured, and mutilated. An enemy who took more than 120 hostages and has not released them. Nor have they allowed the Red Cross to provide wellness checks. And I'm sad to report that most Israelis that I talk to imagine the majority of the hostages are not even alive. For clarity's sake, to continue on this path for us as a nation, for us as a church, without severe judgment requires you to believe that there is no God. What are we doing? Well, I want to spend the time we have talking about Israel, the church, and the nations. And I would submit to you that an awareness of the people of Israel and what's happening in the land of Israel is more than some theological subset that you could afford to be interested in or not. To fail to understand what God is doing in the land of Israel and with the Jewish people leaves you unprepared to understand what he's doing in our own world. And I would invite you away from the temptation to be distracted by the activities of your families, by the plans for your summer vacation, by staring at your financial portfolio. I'm not opposed to vacations or families or finance. But in America, we still retain enough freedom and liberty that you can have the, the inappropriate imagination that you can medicate with distractions. I'm assure, I assure you there's no distraction today in Israel that's sufficient to keep them from being aware of the problems they have. And that scenario is not far from us. So it requires of us a change of cadence, a new response. I want to start with Israel and the church. I'm back on your notes. It's safer ground for me. There's some remarkably exciting things that are happening. God is moving in the land of Israel in ways I've never seen. He's revealing himself to the people. It's true, it's a very difficult time. The streets of Jerusalem are empty. The hotels are, are almost empty. It's a wonderful time to visit. You don't stand in line anywhere. <laughs> unless you've seen it when it's healthy and vibrant. I had a meeting with a businessman who's a friend of mine. He's a believer, second generation believer there. And he had a call from a young woman who lives in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is one of the most secular cities in Europe. And the young woman had had a, a difficult life, far from God. And in a place of desperation, she made the trip to Jerusalem to go pray at the Western Wall, the, the Wailing Wall. It's a part of the foundation wall of Solomon's Temple, the holiest place in Judaism. And the, the people there go to pray, religious and secular alike. They take little prayers and they roll them up and they slip them into the cracks in the wall. And if you visit there, it's not uncommon for the wind to be blowing and there'll be prayers in the wall and prayers blowing around on the ground. And the woman made the trip to Jerusalem to go to the wall to put in a prayer. And she told my friend, she said, I, I rolled it up and put it in the wall. Jesus, if you're real, let me know. It's a point of tremendous division amongst the Jewish people. And she slipped it in the wall and she turned to walk away. And she said, well, I made my way through the streets of the old city of Jerusalem. She said, I can't explain it, but I understood without a doubt that Jesus was real and alive. And she said, I don't know what to do with that. And she called my friend and he connected with her, with her with the community of believers and, and her journey begins. It's happening throughout the land. It's happening throughout the earth. And you and I better decide it's happening with us. It's not enough to be churched or religious or have a set of rules or belong to a group. Folks, please don't imagine that you can sit in a building and be at peace with God or put your name on a list or put your name on a roll. And please stop reciting some historical point where you had an entry, an access point into the kingdom of God. I'm grateful for that. It's important. We work towards that. We're baptizing hundreds of people during our spring festival. But that's an initiation point. It's a beginning point. It's not a conclusion. 
It's not the time to sit down. It's the time to begin the sprint. And I'm concerned for us. Israel and the church, we have one covenant that unites us. There are not two separate paths to God. There's not a Jewish path and a Gentile path. There is one path. The church did not replace Israel in God's purposes. A large segment of Christendom, particularly evangelical Christendom, likes to say that wherever you read Israel or the Jewish people, you can just pencil in the church. It's bad theology. We stand together, the Jewish people, and the Gentile believers, we stand together in God's unfolding purposes. And both Jew and Gentile believers are opposed by the spirit of Antichrist. What you see falling out of the sky on the people of Israel today is a physical expression of the spirit of Antichrist. And if you've even marginally read your Bible, you know before we end this season that that spirit is going to be unleashed on us. So what we're watching should be a wake-up call. The hatred expressed towards the Jewish people will without question be just as fully expressed towards every believer in Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. You won't hide because of a nation that you think will protect you. Right. The Bible gives us a completely different scenario. There are differing places in God's unfolding purposes. I want to look at Romans chapter 9. It says, The people of Israel, theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. I understand that many, for many of you, the, the topic of Israel or the Jewish people is pretty marginal in your spiritual formation. But I would point out to you, this isn't some marginal passage from the Hebrew Bible. This is the book of Romans, the most remarkable treatise on the Christian faith that's ever been penned, in my opinion. And in the midst of that, the Apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, points out to us the contribution of the Jewish people, in the plainest of language, the debt that we have to the Jewish people. Without the Jewish people, we would have no vision of the divine glory, the covenants, the law, the temple worship, the promises of God. We would have no patriarchs. We would have no Messiah. We have no story. And I assure you, the Jewish people have suffered greatly for being a covenant people. And the, the, the expression to them for that from the Gentile nations of the world has been consistent hatred. And the most vocal and the most persistent expression of hatred towards the Jewish people has come from the Christian church. That is a simple matter of history. If you're not aware of our history, I don't have the time today to recite those facts to you, but I assure you they are true. Ephesians 2 and verse 12 speaks to us. Paul's writing to a church of believers, predominantly Gentile, non-Jewish believers. He says, remember at that time you were separate from Christ, the Messiah, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, now is a timing word. It's different than before. And it isn't about the future. Now means when? Now, this is the smart group, God. <laughs> but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. We're described by, in that passage by the Apostle Paul, a Pharisee, an observant Jewish man, if you prefer. He says, prior to Jesus' entry, we were separate from Christ and excluded from citizenship in Israel, foreigners to the covenants of promise. You see, there is some connection with the people of Israel that cause us to be covenants, partakers in the covenants of promise. In Christ, he said, we have been brought near. Jesus did not make us separate from from the covenants God made with Abram. Jesus made it possible for us to be partakers in the covenant he made with Abraham. We're not something new. We're not special. 
You know, one of the great problems of religious people, and it's consistent throughout our history, is self-righteousness. We imagine that we're better than others. If you've grown up in Christianity, and you grew up in a particular tradition, which is my kinder word for denomination, I'm not opposed to them. But every group has a tendency to define ourselves on why we're better. We take communion better than you do. Our form of worship is better than yours. Our translation of the Bible is superior to yours. We find a reason to be better. Amen? And we won't typically say it. We, out loud, we have all kinds of languages, how we want to work together and we're unified. Baloney. It's a Greek word. means I strongly disagree. Because there is very little evidence we work together. Oh, we've got a lot of fancy language. Formally, we call it liturgy. That means words you very often pay little attention to. Well, what I find amongst both the Jewish community of believers and the Gentile community is we think we're better. You hear it expressed. You know, I don't like to read the Old Testament. God's so harsh. I'm a New Testament person. I'm a New Covenant kind of person. Let me help you with that. The New Covenant makes absolutely no sense apart from the Hebrew Bible. It's indecipherable. And on the other end of the spectrum, my Jewish friends that are believers go, you know, well, I, everything I believe about God begins in the Hebrew, but we're special. So to everybody, Jew and Gentile, we're not special. We're in Christ. That's what we got. Let's humble ourselves. We've been brought near through him. Israel and the Jewish people have a unique commitment from God. He promised them a piece of land, terra firma, a place on this globe. He gave them a physical inheritance. It was a part of his agreement with them. That's a remarkable thing. In Genesis 13, which is very near the beginning of the book, if you're new to this stuff, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, lift up your eyes from where you are and look to the north, the south, the east, and the west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. Until the United Nations is formed. Until the U.S. State Department says, no, no, no. No, Almighty God, the one who created the heavens and built the, established the foundations of the earth, gave that land to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob forever. Now, some won't like it, duly noted. And when you meet the boss, you can take it up with him if you'd like. To the church, he made a different commitment. Now, for definition's sake, the church is comprised of people from every nation, race, language, and tribe who, have cho who believe Jesus of Nazareth is the Messiah and have chosen him as Lord and serve him as king. You can't leave out any part of that. To the church, he made a different commitment. It has to do with promises, but it's not about a, la a promised land. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Through these, he has given us very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. The promise that comes to us through Jesus' redemptive work is not a deed to a plot of ground on this planet. It's to a land of the promises of God. So that wherever we live, Whatever language we speak, however we may look, we have status in the authority and the power of God's eternal kingdom, and his promises to us in Christ, the Bible says, are yes and amen. Understand the distinction. And one did not negate the other. You're not special. Now, there's one covenant that unites us, and I'm going to take a moment with this 
Because there are, are, are many streams of thought within Christendom that say uh, otherwise. And I would rather just show you the biblical truth than try to point out the fallacies of 40 different things. Know the truth, you'll be okay. You know, I'm told that people who are trained to identify counterfeit don't study all the different ways you can counterfeit money. What they study is what the authentic looks like. So that if you pick up something that's false, you'll immediately know that. So I'd rather show you what I understand the Bible to, to present to us. And one, the first is that there's not two separate paths to God. The Jewish people don't have one path and the non-Jewish people have another. We all find our way into the kingdom of God in the same way. It's very important. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 11, it says, therefore, remember. And if Paul's telling the church at Ephesus to remember something, you can be pretty certain that they tend to forget it. Remember that formerly you who were Gentiles, and Gentile is the New Testament word that means you're not Jewish. It's everybody else. You who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcised, by those who were Jewish. That done in the body by the hands of men. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. What is it that brings us near to God? Joining the right church, being a part of the right group, reading the right translation, taking communion in the best way? No. It's our affiliation with Jesus and the, the, what his shed blood has done on our behalf. Look in Galatians 3. You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed with yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Some of you have memorized that 29th verse. If you belong to Christ, the, the qualification in that little preposition if, if you belong to Christ, not if you belong to church, not if you belong to some group, if you belong to Jesus. Question, to whom do you belong? What is the authority in your life? Who establishes the priorities? Who makes the demands upon your time and your resources? And if the answer is, I do, then you don't belong to Christ. Right. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed. You've been included in that covenant. And you are heirs according to the promise. Paul goes into some rather elaborate language in the book of Romans to talk about how we've been grafted in to a tree so that all the blessings that come to us extend from the blessings God made long before Jesus was born in the stable in Bethlehem. We're not two separate paths. The goal for my, my Jewish friends is not to cause them to convert to Christianity, but to help them acknowledge that Jesus of Nazareth is their Messiah. Jesus was an observant Jewish rabbi they don't need to be more like me. They've got to grapple with the truth about Jesus. And you and I, we have to get over our arrogance that we're more right and somehow superior, that we haven't missed it, that we haven't made mistakes. May I remind you that we've had two millennia with the assignment to preach the gospel in the whole world. And I'm pretty certain that our vacations get on our calendar before the assignment to preach the gospel does. So before we wag our fingers and shake our heads at someone else's disobedience, we got to go find a mirror and say, really all I wanted to do was go to heaven and not go to hell. And I could have cared less about the purposes of God. Not two covenants. Well, then I would take a moment and just to reinforce for you biblically that the church did not replace Israel. Look at Romans 11, 1. I ask then, did God reject his people? That's a very common assertion amongst many sets of Christians. That God rejected the Jewish people. After all, they crucified the Messiah. Well, the Romans actually had the ones that had the authority to do that. But did God reject his people? And Paul answers in English, it's a bit softened. In the Greek language, it's the, it's the most strident possible answer. 
In English, by no means, but literally, you know, absolutely not, he said. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know that the scripture says in the passage about Elijah how he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they've killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I'm the only one left. Elijah was complaining about his folk. And they're trying to kill me. And what God answered, I've reserved for my 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to Baal. There is tremendous diversity in the Jewish community. So the most fervent, godly, honorable people I've ever known. And some of the most wicked. And I, having spent my life, my adult life, in the Christian church, I can tell you I'm under that umbrella of ch church are some of the most remarkable, holy, humble servants of God I've ever known. And some of the most wicked. We've got to be a bit more astute, wiser observers. See, one of the challenges for the Jewish people when they look at Christian community is they imagine we're the same, that we're homogenous, that a Christian is a Christian is a Christian. And they know that in the 15th century, the Spanish Inquisition was driven by the church, and the Jewish people were tortured and forced to convert to Christianity or driven from their homes and driven out of the nation. To which we respond, well, they weren't good Christians. And the Jewish people go, I don't know. I don't know the difference between a good one and a bad one. I just know what the church did. And we have a tendency in the same way to look at the Jewish community and imagine they're homogenous, that they're all the same. And I assure you, they're not. Tel Aviv is the gay capital of Europe. They market themselves in that way. All the challenges that we find in our own hearts and in our own community, you find in the communities of Israel. But it doesn't mean that God has rejected them any more than it means he's rejected you and me. Galatians chapter 3, you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. What an amazing statement. We stand together in that. Look at Ephesians 2.13. Now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and his regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. I hear Christians say rather frequently that Jesus was the end of the law, which is a biblical statement. But they don't finish the verse. It says that he was the end of the law as a means of righteousness. That we no longer establish our standing with God by keeping a set of rules. Right. But it doesn't mean God got soft when he finished Malachi. Right. It wasn't like he got the Ten Commandments out and went, whew, that was harsh. <laughs> Thou shalt commit only a little adultery. <laughs> no, he didn't. His character didn't change. His determination didn't change. It's just our standing with God is not established by our ability to keep the rules because none of us can keep them perfectly. And the standard is absolute holiness, perfection. God does not grade on a curve. That's why we needed a savior. That's why we needed somebody to exhaust the punishment for our ungodliness so that we could in turn receive the blessings due his perfect obedience. And having received that tremendous gift of grace and the gift of righteousness, it does not remove us from a lifelong commitment to walk uprightly, holy lives before God. There is an insidious idea that has flourished amongst the church that because of the great grace of God and the love of God, it no longer really matters how we live. Folks, that is a perversion. If you're leading a sloppy life, please do not imagine there are no consequences. Please. If you have occupied a seat amongst the lukewarm, I want to invite you, not to suit me, just simply begin to say to the Lord, Lord, I would like to learn to honor you. Give me a new love for you. I'll tell you some ways you can kind of sort that out. 
God does it in my life. One of the real indicators for me that I was much further away from the Lord than I should be is I didn't like his people. <laughs> you laugh because it's so obvious when somebody says it out loud. But I was like, oh, I don't like to hang out with Christians. Whew. <laughs> they annoyed me for all kinds of reasons. Put me in the middle of ungodly people. I was good to go. And I could give them excuses and grace and mercy. And they were more fun. And I, the Lord began to say to me, you know, if you're more uncomfortable with the wicked than you are the righteous, perhaps. Yep. <laughs> and some of you have a little bit of what I had. The greatest delight in my life. And I don't know how it happened. I don't know exactly when it happened. But it's to be with God's people. I'm, I'm so thankful he let me be a pastor. I get to hang out with God's people. I do. Begin to talk to the Lord. Tell him the truth. Stop the charade. If you don't care about the things of the Lord, tell him. See, it's better to start to be honest with God now while there's still a little bit of road in front of you. Because God delights to show mercy, he says, even to the wicked. Don't wait until there's no more options. Tell him the truth. I have found that the more honest I am with the Lord, the more forthright he is in dealing with me. And that's not a bad thing. It's a tremendous gift. It's a tremendous gift, church. If Israel doesn't matter, you tell the Lord. Silly, I just never cared. I've cared far more about UT sports teams than I did about Israel. God, I get a whole lot more excited about the Titans' wins and losses and what they're going to do in the upcoming draft. The missiles and rockets falling on the city of Jerusalem. Tell him the truth. We want to stop the charade. It's amazing what God is doing. We stand together with the Jewish people. So what should we expect? What's coming? Well, I'll give you a big picture view. First of all, I would tell you that God will continue his restoration of the Jewish people, establishing them in the land that he promised them in spite of the consternation of the nations. And there is great consternation. Our own nation demanded that they withdraw their troops from Gaza under threat of removing all military support well, there's only about 7 million Jews in Israel. They're surrounded by tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people who are sworn to their destruction, who have the resources of the petroleum dollars. So if they're totally isolated, apart from the sovereignty of Almighty God, they have no pathway forward. And the United States, who has been a relatively consistent ally on their part in recent weeks, said, we're not going to demand that the hostages be released. For political expediency, we're going to demand that you remove your forces. Never mind you were invaded by a group of people who, are, who still publicly are sworn and committed to your destruction are, and are funded by Iran. You withdraw your forces. But I'll tell you this. God's judgment will come on us. But he still watches over Israel. In Joel chapter 3 and verse 16, it says, The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. For 2,000 years, they were distributed from about 70 A.D. until 1948. The Jewish people were scattered throughout the nations of the world. No homeland, no, no nation, no central government, no anything. They were assimilated into the nations, partially. And in 1948, when the modern nation of Israel was born, they began to come back. A group of people speaking many different languages. But a group of people united by some things. They still kept Sabbath. They still celebrated Passover. They were still people of the book. God had kept them. There's really nothing else like that in history. 
We are a nation of immigrants. We've come from the nations of the world. We've been here a little over 200 years. And we have been assimilated into a people, assimilated around a set of shared values that have been more significant in our national formation than any other single thing, more significant than our ethnicity or the color of our skin or the accent with which we have spoken. What has bound us together was that biblical worldview. It's established in our founding documents, in our legal system, in our academic system. And we're watching it be systematically dismantled. And we are more fragmented, we're more filled with hate, we are more selfish, and we're more divided than we've ever been in our history as a people. While those leading us tell us they're unifying us. It's called a lie. What binds us together has been that biblical worldview. Not that we have all universally embraced it. We've never been uniquely united around that, but that has been, the, that has been the, the core values around which our nation has coalesced, unmistakably our story. Well, God is watching over the Jewish people. He will continue to do that. Look at Isaiah 44. I'll pour out on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. I'll pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. It's amazing to watch. I've been visiting Israel since I was a boy. And when I first went, it was very much a developing country. The food was very limited. The accommodations were very meager. The roads were two lane, many of them gravel. It was very much a developing country. Today, Israel leads the world in many, many categories. Their technology cor corridor is, is really only exceeded by Silicon Valley. They set world records year after year in agriculture, in a whole variety of products, and for a group of people who for the majority of the 2,000 years of the dispersion weren't allowed to own property, that's a remarkable accomplishment. The most limiting factor in the land of Israel, the most valuable resource in the Middle East is not oil, it's water. The wars in the Middle East have been fought over water, not petroleum. And Israel has implemented technology in the last half dozen years that enables them to, de to desalinate the water of the Mediterranean. And for the first time in their history, they have an abundant supply of water. The desert is blooming. God is keeping his promise to the people of the land of Israel. And as you watch, in spite of the consternation of their enemies, because a great deal of the frustration is the Middle East, is the prosperity and the development of the Jewish people in the land of Israel is a humiliation to their adversaries. Now, there's great stress in front of Jerusalem. Please don't imagine that to be, the, to, to, to be a people with a covenant with God removes you from conflict. There is tremendous destruction in the future of Jerusalem. It's biblical. But you will watch them flourish in spite of the hatred of their enemies. And the Bible very candidly says he will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. You decide. You decide. And in parallel to that, there's a response to the nations. God said in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, and we're watching that happen, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, literally the valley of judgment. And there I'll enter into judgment against them concerning my inheritance, my people Israel. For they scattered my people among the nations and divided up my land. They cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes. They sold girls for wine that they might drink. As I watched the videos of what happened on October the 7th, and they were almost unbearable, I could not help but think of that verse. I was watching video evidence of people doing what Joel talked about. And God said, I will enter into judgment against the nations for how they've treated the Jewish people. If you want a prayer to pray, whether you support the current administration or you do not, that's really irrelevant. I would suggest you begin to pray for them on a daily basis that they will make choices that will bring the blessings of God to us and not the judgment of God to us. Say, well, I didn't vote for them. That will not be a line that helps you. I don't like them. Doesn't matter. It truly doesn't, folks. We have been, do you think that God will only move on your behalf when there's an administration that you prefer? 
it, it's, it's such a wonderful imagination to me that the time will come when the momentum, where godly momentum in our nation will be sustained irrespective of which parties happen to be in influence. The church has become so idolatrous, we think it requires a candidate or a party or a policy. Now, I'm not against to that. I think we have to participate in the process. But the ultimate authority and power is Almighty God. And the expression of that is His people. I'm looking forward to the purposes of God being pushed forth irrespective of parties and policies and elected officials. Church, we need to repent. We've made idols of our party, so we go find one good thing that they do, and we say, therefore, they're godly, or we find one bad thing that we, in a party we don't like, and we, they say, therefore, they're wicked, and we stand watch over a culture that is plummeting into paganism, redefining marriage, redefining family, redefining the authority in our home. We're unwilling to say there's a difference between men and women. We no longer educate our children based on their, their character formation. We educate them based on fun experiences. That is perversion, and it's wicked. And the, the difference, the dividing line is not about an election. It's about the heart of the church. God will gather the Jewish people and establish them in the land he promised to them, and he will respond to the nations based on their attitude toward that divine expression of his purpose. Genesis 12, 3, and I'll close with that. I'll bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Don't spend too much time on the news. It'll make you nuts. But don't ignore what's happening in the world and medicate yourself with an online shopping spree or a trip to wherever it is that you think will distract you enough that you don't have to think about it. You can't hide from what's coming. The rockets that we saw falling on Jerusalem last night when I left service will undoubtedly fall on us. It's beyond naive not to think that. The only difference in what our future will be is about what the, the attitude and the behavior of the church will bring. The attitudes of God's people are far more important than what happens in November. And I believe November is important. But I believe the attitudes of God's people are far more important because I don't think there's any chance that we have an upright and forthright event in November without a change of heart in God's people. I've come to this platform too many times after an election and faced people on both sides of the discussion that were either elated or deflated. Almighty God is our Savior. Amen. And we had better. We had better decide we will stand in the public square, in our professional arena, in the midst of our schools and our communities and our families and our kitchen tables for his principles. We have been idolatrous. I assure you, God will get the attention of the Jewish people. But I can assure you with equal authority, he will get the attention of every person. Let's not wait till he shouts at us. Let's listen when he whispers. Will you stand with me? I'd like to close with a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem. Can we do that? We got to Israel. And the people, as I, as I mentioned, there was a heaviness. They feel so isolated. They said, we feel like refugees in our own, our own nation. About 100,000 Israelis cannot live in their homes today because their homes are under constant shelling, rocket, and missile fire. And it's been that way for six months. They sneak in at night and milk the cows or do what has to be done, and they're back before the daylight comes up again. There's a, there's a tremendous sense of despondency. And we began to say to them, we, at our church, we put up a wall. It's about 80 feet long with a big picture of your flag that says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And they said, really? And so we, we sent a message back home. We said, can you send us a picture of the wall? And we got our phones out and started showing people that wall. And Israelis are not typically particularly emotional with strangers. And I would show it to them and watch tears begin to roll down their faces. 
Really? I walked in a little business in the old city. The man looked so typically Israeli. He looked like a walking piece of leather. <laughs> he was slight built and sober and, you know, our southern banter of how are you, that's not the Middle East. And I walked into his little shop and he said, why are you here? There was nobody else there. And we said, well, we, we have friends here and we came to see our friends. And he said, well, I, I have two boys in the military and I've had no business for six months and I don't know what I'm going to do. And I, we put, put, got our phone and said, we pray for you. And a tear rolled down his face. And something that ne has never happened to me in all the years... He was behind the counter and he stood up and again, this isn't Israeli. He said, I know this is odd. Kathy was with me. He said, could I have a hug? And he came around the counter. And I said, we're praying for you, but I, could we pray for you now? You know that let's pray thing? I'm paying attention, folks. I am. And we put our hands on him and we said a prayer for him out loud in the old city of Jerusalem in Jesus' name. And when I opened my eyes, there were tears running down his face. And he said, thank you so much. Folks, God is moving. God is moving. Don't be filled with despair. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that in your great mercy and wisdom, you have awakened us. And Lord, we stand today to acknowledge a desire to know you better. Lord, not to stand in arrogance or presumption or self-righteousness or smugness. Lord, not to look condescendingly at others, but to present ourselves with humility and say, Father, give us a revelation. Give us understanding hearts, eyes to see and ears to hear, to be aware of what you're doing in the world today. Forgive us of our idolatry. Forgive us of being distracted. Forgive us of being disinterested. Forgive us of being lukewarm, Lord. Ignite a passion within us to, to serve you with our whole heart, mind, soul, and body. And we pray for our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel today. Lord, I pray that, that you will provide protection far greater than any iron dome. I pray for your mercy upon them. Give them a revelation of yourself in the midst of the stress. Bring joy in the midst of the heaviness. May the oppression be lifted. Lord, I thank you that we'll see a moving of your spirit in that land beyond anything we've ever known. And we pray for our leaders. Lord, those with influence, those who are making the decisions, whomever they may be, that they would make choices regarding the land of Israel and the Jewish people that would bring your blessings to us and not your curse. Father, may those who would in make wicked choices and ungodly choices be silenced. May their plans fail. May their schemes unravel. May they be exposed. May the truth be shouted from the housetops. And may your people have a, de a desire to see. We thank you for it. We praise you that the one who watches over us never slumbers nor sleeps. That we are on this planet for a purpose that we've been filled with your spirit, that we might fulfill what you created us for. May you be pleased with us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. And thank you for your prayers.